Hello, today's spine conference will be on flatback syndrome. Flatback syndrome is an iatrogenic disease. We cause this disease uh, in people usually, and it usually comes from uh, trying to help people and trying to fuse their spine for different reasons, for scoliosis, for arthritis, for tumors, and things like that. Um, you know, unfortunately, flatback syndrome is most associated with Harrington rods, and this is a, a photograph of Paul Harrington, who was a real pioneer in orthopedics. Uh, uh, there were probably a million cases done with an Harrington rod, and uh, Paul Harrington al also was a tremendous person. He was a national javelin champion. Uh, he was from Kansas. Uh, he served our country uh, in the military, um, um, leading a, a large field hospital. Uh, and he developed the Harrington rod, which um, uh, straightened scoliosis. Uh, it was designed for children with polio. But the um, unfortunate uh, problem that it also did was um, it made the, the spine flat on the side view. Uh, normally the spine has a very nice gentle contour uh, and the head is balanced over the pelvis. But um, when the Harrington rods are used, it straightens out the spine on the front view. Uh, but then on the side view, the spine becomes um, uh, straight as well, and normally it should not be straight, it should have a curve. So although it fixes um, on the front view from a curve to straight, on the side view it goes from curved to straight as well, which is not a good thing uh, on the, um, in the sagittal uh, view. So you can see here a side view or a sagittal view of the spine, normally it should have a nice gentle contour lumbar lordosis, thoracic kyphosis, and then cervical lordosis, and the head should be balanced over the pelvis. But when one loses this normal curvature and, and gets a flat back, which can, can occur with a Harrington rod, your head is now pitched forward, uh, which causes a serious problem. You could imagine the forces that go across uh, the spine. Here's the leaning tower of Pisa. causes a lot of stress and pain and it's exhausting trying to walk in this manner because you're always uh, firing your extensor muscles to try to stay upright. So there's uh, nothing's better than illustrative cases. Here's an illustrative case uh, of a 64-year-old um, woman with, um, who presented to my office this year with low back pain and left grade and right hip pain. Uh, presented in July 2011, which was four months ago. She had had two previous spinal surgeries, a posterior L4 to S1 fusion, which seemed to have fused in 1993, 18 years ago, and then five years ago, <coughs> an anterior lumbar antibody fusion at L3 or So she was fused posteriorly from L4 to S1, solidly fused, although there was spondylolisthesis, she was fused with, uh, with her deformity intact. Then she developed spondylolisthesis at L3-L4 uh, and she was then taken for an anterior lumbar antibody fusion and fused at L3-L4 for again spondylolisthesis. And what this did was it basically fused her uh, in a kyphotic uh, uh, position in the lumbar spine. You can see the gravity line from C7 is way anterior to the pelvis. The gravity line from T12 is anterior to the pelvis. And you see she has a hip flexion contracture because she's trying to stand straight. She has a crouched posture. So she not only has a um, pitched anterior um, um, gravity line, but also she has two levels of spondylolisthesis. So you can see the lumbar spine is fused, L405 is fused in spondylolisthesis, L304 again is fused in spondylolisthesis, and she's pitched way forward. And you can see on the AP view there's a solid fusion mass. And here she is clinically, uh, front view she's, she's good, on the side view you see she's uh, flexed bent forward and this is she's trying to stand upright as much as she can and I asked her to pull her uh, skirt upwards so that you can see her posture she's in a crouched posture and she has to do this so that she can see straight uh, and this is very uncomfortable to her uh, the crouched uh, posture of hip flexion knee flexion contractures is very uh, uncomfortable if you, if you just try try to do it for five minutes and see how you feel um, uh, bending forwards and then crouching your hips and your knees. It's very tiring and very uncomfortable. Here's a CT scan which probably shows the deformity best. You can see L5 S1 is severely degenerated. Uh, L4 L5 has spondylolisthesis. In fact, maybe a little bit of kyphosis there as well. You can see anteriorly it's compressed as compared to posteriorly. And then L3 L4 was fused 
in the spondylolisthesis deformity uh, in place. L2, L3, you can see it's deteriorating. On the MRI scan, um, you can see there's a bridging bone at L3, L4 and some unusual changes in the marrow within the L3, L4 uh, vertebra, which may be some kind of stress reaction or some kind of fusion reaction that's been occurring over years time. You can see at L2, L3, above the previous uh, fusion, there's a bulging disc and the two levels of deformity. And this uh, gives you an idea of what um, L3, L4 looks like on both MRI scan and CAT scan, <coughs> where she's solidly fused anteriorly in this deformed position. To take a look at the spinal canal, axial cuts of the MRI are best. L1, L2 on the top left uh, shows what the spinal canal should normally look like. At L2, L3 on the right, uh, you see the gapped facets with the increased signal within the facets, which is uh, significant in the sense that um, it means that there's some level of dynamic spondylolisthesis and uh, degeneration. So L2, L3 has to be included. L3, L4, which was fused in the front anteriorly, has residual stenosis. So it was never decompressed. And L4, L5, uh, spinal canal looks reasonable, um, but she's solidly fused at L4, L5. Um, L5-S1 is a relatively normal appearing, although she's been fused posteriorly, the facets were never fused, but she did fuse from the transverse process to the sacral ala. And on the top left, uh, where there's an arrow, you can see the left ilium is abnormal, where the bone graft has been harvested, and I believe she fractured through her pelvis post-op. So <coughs> this is of significance because I'd like to place iliac screws, and the anatomy is very abnormal here. So the problem with this in this patient is that uh, she has a flat back deformity. That's the whole point of this uh, talk. But she also has a hip flexion contractures of 20 degrees. I measured this when she laid flat and then also prone. And I asked her to lay in the prone position and try to stretch these in a center of physical therapy pre-op. Her sacral inclination angle should be around 40, but it's 21. She's doing this on purpose so that she can see. Lumbar lordosis should be around uh, 35 to 50. It's only 17 degrees. Kyphosis in the thoracic spine should be 45 she's 13 degrees and basically she's doing this to look upwards so she's making her whole spine straight so that she can see the horizontal she's got a large fusion mass at 45 and a large fusion mass anteriorly at l3 4 so it's a very complicated case so the question is what to do um, I went over the, I think she needs a lot of lordosis, um, and the only way to get this amount of lordosis would be a pedicle subtraction osteotomy, where if you review Bridwell's uh, article in 2003 in JBGS, you should be able to get around uh, 30 degrees, 30 degrees from a pedicle subtraction osteotomy. <coughs> The pedicle subtraction osteotomy is obviously a high-risk case, and the complication rate's about uh, 100%, so... Uh, um, uh, it can be done through the pedicle or um, uh, it can be done through the posterior elements. In this case, um, it has to be done through the posterior elements. And you can see here, uh, preoperatively, I um, drew out and traced the uh, deformity so that I can understand it in my uh, mind. And uh, here's the lateral of my drawing. I then took these drawings and then made the cut that I estimated would, would I could perform in the surgery. L4 would be easier. It's not as deep in the pelvis, and then you would have more fixation points at L5 and S1. But I felt that I could not get the um, um, acceptable amount of lordosis in this manner. Um, I then um, did the same thing at L5, and I felt uh, an L5 pedicle subtraction osteotomy would give um, a much better uh, lordotic contour to the spine and a more natural contour. You have to remember that most of the lordosis that you have in the lumbar spine it is at L5 S1. So the lower you perform the osteotomy, the more correction you get and the more natural of a curve you get. So I thought about things and then um, eventually we did the operation. Uh, here's my operative notes. Uh, the surgery was a big operation in nine hours. Uh, she lost 1.7 liters of blood, um, was given two units of packed red blood cells, 375 cc's of cell saver. Um, and you can see um, in the middle portion where my osteotomy was performed at L5. Uh, and um, I performed the osteotomy, you can see in the bottom, in a chevron type shape. Uh, uh, and in the middle, uh, I kept the spinal canal open uh, so that I can make sure uh, there is no uh, residual compression of the thecal sac or neurological elements when I closed her osteotomy. Uh, I had very strong screws in both iliums and very strong screws in both uh, S1 segments uh, and very good screws at L3, L4. Unfortunately, I could not place a screw at L2 
uh, and had to use crosslinks um, to um, uh, uh, fix things. And you can see a post-op standing view uh, where she has very nice uh, lumbar lordosis um, on, on the right. And here's a, a post-op view. Um, th these are uh, images uh, six weeks post-op which shows uh, everything looks pretty good. She's going on to fuse. The left iliac screw, you remember, was um, uh, very challenging because there's very little room. You can see uh, I performed the post-op cascade just to make sure it's okay. And you can see it's dead center within the ilium. And the best way to see the deformity is probably on CASCAN. And you can see here the L5 pedicle subtraction osteotomy with lordosis of the lumbar spine, um, which is uh, almost physiologic. And here she is post-op six weeks, smiling and straight for the first time in probably 20 years. The second case and last case is a very interesting case of iatrogenic flatback um, syndrome. He's a 67-year-old man who presented initially in 2007 with low back pain, left grade, and right low extremity pain after having had <coughs> an L3 to L5 laminectomy with initial good results in 2000, so seven years prior. And you can see when he, when he presented uh, to my office, uh, he had the degenerative scoliosis <coughs> and loss of all of his lordosis from L1 to L5, but interestingly, the L5-S1 disc looked totally normal with excellent lordosis. I measured 24 degrees. This gives you an idea of his scoliosis and again, a normal L5-S1 disc space. On the axial cuts, he has a trephal spinal canal and stenosis at L1, L2, L2, L3. L3, L4, he's had a previous decompression, but still has a small area for his spinal canal. The L5-S1 axial cut is basically normal. This is in 2007. The facets look normal. Here's an, another idea that gives you an idea of the L5-S1 disc is completely normal, normal height, normal alignment on both uh, T1, T2 weighted images. L5-S1 is completely normal. So the question is what to do. Uh, I elected to do a, a lumbar decompression infusion from L1 to L5, and since the L5-S1 disc is completely normal, I did not do anything at the L5-S1 disc. Uh, his surgery went very well. Um, a revision decompression L1 and L5 is a very large man. It took seven hours. Um, you can see here the decompression where it was performed uh, at left side L1, L2, then uh, centrally from L2 to L5. <coughs> because he had S1 radiculopathy type symptoms, uh, I felt I had to perform a left L5 S1 lamina for aminotomy to ensure that the left S1 root was free of all stenosis. Uh, a very minimal um, removal of the facet was performed at L5 S1. Here's his post-op films, and his lordosis, I felt, looked quite good from L1 to L5. And as you can see on the side view, scoliosis, I felt, was reasonable. Well, he went home where he lived in Ocean City, uh, and he did great, uh, and he felt fine. If there's nothing that hurts your post-operative results, then you know, long-term outcome. And she came back a year later with S1 ner nerve root pain. And now, one year later, his MRI shows a very abnormal L5-S1 disc. Remember how normal it looked before? Bulging disc and modic changes of the L5-S1 disc. And you can see here on the axial cuts on the, on the right there, there's hypertrophy of the facet ligament of flavum all the way to the level of the midline of the spinal canal. So he developed this very degenerated L5-S1 disc very quickly. And it was compressing his root. So the question is what to do, a revision fusion in L5-S1, which would be a very large operation, or just decompress and see what happens. Uh, the patient did not want a big operation, so we performed the left L5-S1 revision decompression, um, which initially did extremely well, and he went back to Ocean City for the winter time. But uh, he came back uh, two years later with just terrible uh, back pain, and now a flat back deformity, and the L5-S1 disc is just completely deteriorating now. You can see here when he extends, he has a vacuum sign, retrolisthesis now. Uh, his uh, L3 vertebral body is 22 degrees uh, from the horizontal, should be straight. So he's got a flat back deformity. <coughs> it just kept getting worse. You can see here several years later, he's on oxycodone. He still doesn't want surgery. He's just absolutely miserable. And uh, you can see how he walks now, completely bent forward. He was like this for years on oxycodone, and he felt he, he could tolerate it. But then a new problem happened where his legs were weak and numb from the groin to his toes and he had a new problem you can see on the MRI on the right he's got a T10 T11 disc herniation now with spinal cord compression and also T12 L1 disc herniation and you can see here on the sagittal cuts at T10 T11 he has a broad-based disc bulge which is compressing his spinal cord 
and he is myelopathic from this. So this is a new problem now on top of this terrible flatback syndrome. Also at T12L1, he's developing stenosis. You can see on the very bottom on the right there, both the bulging disc posteriorly and hypertrophy of the ligament, hypertrophy of the ligament of flavin posteriorly. It's compressing the spinal cord there as well, just above his previous implants. From L1 to L5, where he's had the previous operation, he's solidly fused. But the L5-S1 disc, you can see below it, is terribly degenerated. You can see here on the right a solid fusion mass through the facets from L1 to L5 and a very deteriorated L5-S1 disc space. You can see on the axial cuts on the bottom right, now he's got hypertrophy on the right side compressing his thecal sac. Uh, L4, L5 spinal canal is open, but the T12-L1 uh, segment is very stenotic from a degenerated segment. Basically, he has adjacent segment degeneration above his previous fusion at T12-L1. Here's a standing view. He's got terrible flatback deformity. He should have a lot of lordosis at L5-S1. You can see, in, in fact, he has kyphosis at L5-S1. He's got a pitched, in, in, uh, pitched sagittal plumb line way anterior. So this man is very complicated. You can see here in my drawing and my thoughts, he's got spinal cord compression T10, T11, spinal cord compression T12-L1, and he's got clinical myelopathy, a solid fusion from L1 to L5, but a terribly degenerated L5-S1 disc with significant kyphosis there. So I discussed all the issues with the patient and he felt he'd like to just get it all done in one surgery. <clears throat> so I felt uh, the best uh, surgery for him, uh, which was a very large operation, uh, was removing the old implants, exploring the fusion mass, inserting new pedicle screws from T9 to S1 with the iliac screws, decompressing the spinal cord where the ligament of was hypertrophic and opening up the spinal cord at T10, T11, T12, L1. Then a revision decompression at L3 to S1 and a chevron osteotomy and then a pedicle subtraction osteotomy at L4 to address his flatback syndrome. And the postoperative CT showed excellent lumbar lordosis of 50 degrees from S1 to L1. And you can see here um, a postoperative standing x-ray um, nice lordosis of the lumbar spine gained from an L4 pedicle subtraction osteotomy and also uh, I took him back a week later for an anterior lumbar interbody fusion so that um, I can uh, make sure he fuses at the L5-S1 segment. And you can see here the allograft at L5-S1 um, and on the right you can see his post-operative staining film. Unfortunately now he's developing a little bit of spondylolisthesis uh, uh, at the level um, just above where his implants stop. Here he is post-op, he's very happy, he's off most of the opiates, he's standing straight, things are well. You can get an understanding of what he was before, he's a very miserable man. Thanks for your attention, this is the end of the uh, talk. If you like this uh, talk, please subscribe.